Okay, well, the last time we uh, met, I said that I had uh, concluded that series on um, the order of salvation, and so that was my intention, but, uh, but before I could go on to something else, there was one more message I thought I should, uh, I should bring, and so I guess I spoke a little too soon. So I do want to bring uh, uh, something related to what we've been talking about the last several, I don't know, 10 or, 10 or 11 times that we've met. Um, and that is the subject of uh, union with Christ. Union with Christ. Um, and really, every aspect of our relationship to God is in some way connected to our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we can say that, that union with Christ is a central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. You know, we've been looking at these different aspects of our salvation and regeneration and justification, adoption, and so, but underneath all of these, we could say there's, there's one truth that kind of encompasses all of these, and that is the fact that if, as Christians, we are united with Christ. We are in union with Christ. Um, now, you know, a lot of theologians, if you, if you look at that uh, order of salvation, you know, those lists of those steps, a, a lot of them don't necessarily include this idea of union with Christ, uh, but some of them do, and when they do, they kind of put it in different places. You know, remember we said that, that order was supposed to be kind of a logical sequence to help us understand how God applies these different aspects of our salvation. Um, for example, Robert Raymond and his systematic theology, this idea of union with Christ uh, immediately after his discussion of faith, because it's by faith that a sinner is actually united to Christ, Okay. Uh, John Murray, he puts this idea of union with Christ right before glorification. And then uh, Wayne Grudem puts it immediately after glorification. All right. So, but, you know, regardless of where we put this subject in the order of salvation, it's an important uh, doctrine to study. And, and so hopefully this will be uh, profitable for all of us. Okay, so what does it mean to be in union with Christ? Uh, well, one definition from a systematic theology text is this. Union with Christ is a phrase used to summarize several different relationships between believers and Christ through which Christians receive every benefit of salvation. And th those relationships include the fact that we are in Christ, the fact that Christ is in us, the fact that we are like Christ, and that we are with Christ. Okay, so those are some of the phrases that are used to describe this concept of being in Christ. Now, the uh, Westminster Confession, Larger Catechism, has a question. Uh, it's question 66, and it says this. What is that union which the elect have with Christ? Okay, and the answer is, according to the confession, uh, or the catechism, is the union which the elect have with Christ is the work of God's grace whereby they are spiritually and mystically, yet really and inseparably joined to Christ as their head and husband, which is done in their effectual calling. Okay, and, and we'll look at that in a little more detail, but the, the, main, the key ideas there, are it's, it's a, a spiritual and mystical and yet real and inseparable joining to Christ, being joined to Christ, okay? Now, another way we can think about uh, union with Christ, this idea of being united to Christ, is uh, in terms of, the, there's a phrase that's used a lot in the New Testament um, that, that describes this idea, this concept of being united to Christ. It's used frequently. Does anybody have any idea what that is? Just, it's two words. In Christ. It's what, sealed, sealed in Christ, but, but the phrase is in Christ. And that's found, you know, and we use that a lot just in our, in our interaction and our, you know, communication with one another, you know, we'll, uh, we address one another as a brother or sister in Christ. If you write a letter to somebody or an email, a lot of times, you know, typically you'll say, uh, you know, in Christ or sincerely in Christ or love in Christ, okay? So that's a common way that we even communicate with one another. Um, and so when we talk about being in Christ, that's really what we mean by this idea of being in union with him, in being, in being in fellowship with him. And so that phrase, in Christ, is found uh, quite a bit. It's found 87 times in the New Testament in the ESV. Uh, it's not 
quite as many times in the King James, 75, and in the New King James, about, about 85 times. Okay, so but it's found a lot. Um, and that doesn't include, there are other places where the phrase is not, it's, uh, maybe it's in him or in the beloved. Okay, so that's not even including those, those references. But uh, 87 times it's, it's found uh, in Christ. And so uh, what I want to do just initially is just I want to read some of these to you just to give you a flavor for what all is involved in the fact that if you are a Christian, we are in Christ. Okay, we are united to Christ in some spiritual but real way. Okay, so I'll just, I'm just going to read these to you. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to turn to these. If you, you want to jot these down, you can. And then some of these we'll, we'll look at in a little more detail. Okay, so what are some of the things that are, are we, we're told about being in Christ? Well, we're told in Romans 3.24 that redemption is found in Christ. Romans 3.24 says, And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay? So that's where our redemption comes from. It comes from our, by virtue of being in Christ. Uh, we're also told in Romans, a lot of these come from Romans. Romans 8 verse 1 that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, right? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who, who are in Christ Jesus, all right? So our condemnation has been removed. Romans, the next verse, Romans 8, 2 says this, we are set free from the law of sin and death by virtue of being in Christ. There is therefore, I'm sorry, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Okay. Uh, Romans 6.23 tells us that uh, eternal life is found in Christ. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of God is found uniquely in Christ, right? Romans 8.38 uh, and 39 says this, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, and so now, you know, God does have a, a general love for all mankind. We know that. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. Um, we're also told in Matthew 5 that uh, God causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. But his love that guarantees the eternal security of the believer, that we will never be separated from God, that love is found specifically in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, what else do we know about being in Christ? Well, we are sanctified in Christ. Uh, a couple of verses here. 1 Corinthians 1, 2 says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Okay, so we are sanctified. We are set apart to be holy by virtue of being in Christ. Another verse speaks about our sanctification is Romans six eleven, says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God, how? In Christ Jesus. Okay? All right. So we are to, to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God by virtue of the fact that we have been put into this relationship that we are with Christ. We are in union with Jesus Christ. What else do we know? About being in Christ? Well, we are made, believers are made a new creation in Christ. Right? 2 Corinthians 5.17, can anybody quote that? 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or a new creature. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All right, so if we are in Christ, that's another aspect of that is the fact that we are, we are a new creature, we are a new creation. Um, another verse that says basically the same thing, Ephesians 2 verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay? So we've been created or we've been recreated as a new creature uh, by virtue of being in Christ. 
Um, just a couple more. Believers are reconciled to God, how? In Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. What else? Well, we become sons of God through faith in Christ, right? For in Christ Jesus, this is Galatians... In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Um, How about what happens when we die, when believers die? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, so even in, even in death, our relationship, of our, this union that we have in Christ uh, remains. It's not broken. It's not severed. Okay, and so if anything uh, proves that this union we have, that we're I'm gonna, we're, we're going to talk, we'll flesh it out, but that that it can't be broken is the fact that even in death, we're 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 called, we're referred to as being in Christ. The, the dead in Christ will rise first. All right, how about in the resurrection? Believers are said to be made alive in the resurrection. How? In Christ. It's in Christ that this happens. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Okay, so I'm just trying to get, and this is just a sample, but just trying to give you kind of a flavor of the richness of what's involved in the fact that if you are a Christian, we have this relationship with Jesus Christ that we are, we are united to him in a real, in a tangible, it's a spiritual sense, but it's a real relationship that is uh, unbroken, that can't be broken. Um, all right, now one more uh, verse. If you want to turn here, you can. you can. We can turn to Ephesians 1. We're going to look at, a, look at a few verses in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. So Paul says here, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Okay, so... Here we're told that, that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is found where? It's found in Christ. Yeah, it's found, it's found in Him. All right? And we're also told that when did God the Father, in His electing love, when did He, or how did He choose us? He chose us before the foundation of the world in Christ. Right? Um, and so let me read to you a quote here. I thought this was helpful. Uh, this is from uh, John Murray, who's a, a theologian. And he's, he writes this about these verses um, here, uh, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. And this idea, that, uh, this idea that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. He says this. The Father elected from eternity, but he elected in Christ. We are not able to understand all that is involved, but the fact is plain enough that there was no election of the Father in eternity apart from Christ. And that means that those who will be saved were not even contemplated by the Father in the ultimate counsel of of his predestinating love apart from union with Christ. They were chosen in Christ. As far back as we can go in tracing salvation to its fountain, we find union with Christ. It is not something tacked on. It is there from the outset. And so what he's saying is that there's a sense in which, in, in, in God's, from God's perspective or in God's mind, every Christian has, in, in some sense, always been in union with Christ. Okay? If we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, then in, in, in some sense, in God's mind, in his eye, 
Christians have, have, believers, the elect, have always been in union with Christ. Now we see this also, which is, if you think about that, that's a pretty staggering thought, if you think about that for a couple of seconds, right? Um, and we see the same truth expressed in 2 Timothy 1.9, and you can just, you can just, if you want to turn there, you can, I'll read this, 2 Timothy 1.9. says this. It says, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And that phrase there, before the ages began, in, in the Greek, it, it, it literally means uh, before times eternal. And so other, other translations say, from all eternity. All right? So God called us, and uh, not because of any works we had done, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us, his grace was given to us in some sense in Christ before the ages began. All right? Okay, so, uh, so however you know, uh, incredibly true that statement is, um, it doesn't mean that there is no transition from, from wrath to grace in history, okay? So in other words, though, according to these verses, uh, the elect, those whom God has chosen in Christ from, from before the foundations of the world, although in a sense they were loved in God's electing love, in a real way, th these, those of us believers uh, were also at a point in time, we were by nature what? Children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, right? Ephesians 2, verse 3 says this. So, you know, Paul, later on in Ephesians, you know, he's, he's writing this amazing truth to the Ephesians, and then later on he reminds them, though, but remember, by nature, you were by, once, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Ephesians 2, verse 3. And he also says later on in, in, in chapter 2, he says that there was a time when they, the Ephesian believers, were separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay? And so, so we're not denying that truth. The Bible teaches very clearly that, that uh, until someone comes to faith in Christ, we are an object of God's, of God's wrath. Okay? Uh, so although, Although believers have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, until we actually come to faith in Christ, believe in Christ, trust in Him, then we don't, be, we don't become partakers of Christ, and we don't uh, enter into all these blessings that we've been talking about until we actually believe on Christ and trust in Him. Okay? All right, so, so what, are some, um, uh, what are some pictures or maybe some illustrations that might help us to understand this idea of being uh, in Christ or being in union with with Christ, well, there there are several. The Bible gives us a number, um, so I'll, let me I'll go through these with you, from the maybe the, the lowest level to the highest. All right, the lowest uh, level we could say, or a picture of the union that believers have with Christ, is found in the the idea of the relationship that exists between a stone or stones of a building and the chief cornerstone. Right. And the stones of the building are as a reference to, to Christians, to believers. The chief cornerstone is a reference to, to Christ, right? So where, are we, where do we see that? Well, in two places in the New Testament, uh, Ephesians 2, and you, you can just, if you want to turn there, you can, or I'll, I'll just read this to you. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, says this. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, so here's a picture of, of, of Jesus being the cornerstone and, and uh, the foundation being laid of the apostles and prophets and then believers being stones as part of this part of the the the, the, the building that that Christ is is building is erecting we see the same idea in first Peter 2 first Peter 2 4 and 5 it says as you come to him 
to Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so, so what, do we, what do we get from that picture? How does that help us to understand our relationship with Christ? Well, what do we know about stones in a building? Well, there, there's a dependency upon one another, right? There's a, there's a unity there. There's a permanent relationship there. Uh, and particularly a dependency upon the cornerstone, which, what was the cornerstone? Well, the cornerstone was the stone that was placed first, right, when the building is being erected, and it's the stone upon which everything else gets measured, right? All right, and so all the other stones are set in reference to the cornerstone. So this gives us maybe a little idea of our relationship, what our relationship is like by being uh, in Christ. That's one picture. All right, let me give you another. Another picture is the relationship of, of the vine to the branches. Remember that? Remember John chapter 15? The vine and the branches. Jesus says this. What does he say there? And it's uh, John 15, 1 through 8. Um, but we'll just read verses 4 and 5 of John 15. He says this. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Okay? And so, again, this is a picture of what? It's a picture of, of, uh, of dependency. Right? I mean, branches, you know, I'm not a uh, horticulturist. You know, I know Brother Tim does a lot of planting and growing trees, and my wife does some. I, I'm not. But I know enough to know that, you know, the, the, the branch is dependent upon the vine, right, or the root or the tree, right? I mean, if you cut off a branch, what happens? The branch dies, right? The branch dies. The vine survives. The vine, the vine continues. Uh, maybe eventually another branch grows, right? Okay, but if you cut off the vine, what happens? The whole thing dies, right? I mean, the branches die, the vine dies, right? The, the life is found in the vine. The sap comes up through the vine out to the branches, okay? And so this is a picture, again, of our, if we are the branches, Christ is the vine, of our total uh, dependence upon Christ for our spiritual life, for our spiritual growth, right? All right. So it's a picture of this idea of us being united to Christ. All right, about, how about another one? Another one is found in the relationship between the head, which, which would be Christ, and the other members of the human body, right? Which would be believers, where do we see that? Well, one, one place is Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Ephesians 4 says this. It says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. All right? Okay, so here's another picture of what do we know about the head and the, and, and the parts of our body. Well, this is, a, this is a picture of dependency also, right? I mean, the head controls the body, right? I mean, the arm doesn't decide to do anything without the head telling it what to do, right? Um, and, and the other members of the body are ultimately dependent on the head. I mean, if you cut off a body part... Uh, the head can survive, right? Um, but if you cut off the head, what happens? Well, the whole body is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to die, right? Now, now, you know, there are some animals, I did a little research, that, that apparently can survive. If you cut off their head, there are some animals that apparently can survive for at least a period of days. Or chickens, chickens yeah, chickens, and there's some others. Even like, I, I saw something online. So, so there are some... Uh, some exceptions, but in the human realm, that's not the case, okay? So in this, this analogy, it's a picture of the human body, okay? So Christ is the head, we are the members of the body, so there's this dependency upon him, right? And, and, and life comes from him, all right? Okay, how about another relationship between that's, that's described or given to us as kind of an analogy of what our relationship is like with Christ, being in Christ, is what? The relationship between 
a husband and a wife, right? The husband being a picture of Christ, the wife being a picture of, of believers or of the church, right? Where do we see that? Uh, well, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Um, I'm not gonna, I won't read that whole passage, but you're, you're probably familiar with that, that passage there that Paul describes the husband and wife, their roles and duties. But, then, but he says this, he says, Ephesians 5, verse 22, he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and, and is himself its savior. Okay, so there's a correlation between a husband and his role and, and, and the role of, of Christ in his relationship to the church. And then he says specifically in verse 32 of Ephesians 5, he says, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Okay, so, so the relationship of a husband and wife is, is given as a picture here, an analogy of what the relationship of Christians, believers, is like in some way to Christ. Okay, so what do we know about, I mean, how does that help us? Well, what do we know about a relationship between a, a man and a wife? Well, there's uh, not only, there's a dependency or codependency, but there's a lot of, what, physical and emotional and spiritual intimacy, right, and, and love between a man and, and his wife. And so I think that's a picture of the intimacy that, that exists between, and the love between Christ as the head of the church and, and the church or believers as his, his bride. Um, there's another reference, uh, another picture, um, Romans 5, 19. Let me just uh, read that, I didn't... It's, it's a, a reference to... The fact that, that Adam w is considered the, the, the head of the human race, or you, maybe you've heard the term the federal head. So in other words, when Adam sinned, and what Adam did, his sin was, he represented humanity in that sin, okay? That's where we, we get the concept of original sin, or um, you know, sin being transmitted to us from Adam. So Adam represented all of humanity, okay? And so we're told in Ephesians, or Romans 5, 19, well, let me read, I'll start read verse 18, 18 and 19 of Romans 5. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, it's talking about the sin of Adam, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Okay? So this is a contrast between Adam and his sin and the fact that everyone fell or sinned in him. Okay? And, yet, and Jesus has come as the, as, as the new Adam. And by his righteousness and by his obedience, uh, those of us who are, who are in him, that, that righteousness and obedience is, is given to us. Okay? By virtue of the fact that this relationship that exists between us in Christ. And so that's another picture of this union we have with Christ, okay? That whatever Jesus, his righteousness, his obedience, uh, everything that he did, that he accomplished, is, uh, is, is given to us by virtue of the fact that he represents us. We are, if we're a Christian, we, we are in Christ, okay? So that's another picture of this relationship. Um, and then, there's even a higher level, a higher analogy that's given uh, to, to, to give us an idea of, of what it's like to be in union with Christ, okay? And this is Jesus himself tells us. He says that the believer's union with Christ is even compared to the perfect union and communion that exists between the three persons of the Trinity, okay? Between God the Father and, and, and Christ and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he says this in John 14, verse 23. He says this. John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Okay, so he says, he and the Father will come and make an abode or make a dwelling or make a home with 
the believer. Now he's, and then he says um, in John 17, just a couple chapters over, he kind of expands on this. John 17, 21 through 23, he says this. He's praying here. This is in John, his high priestly prayer. And he's praying and he says in verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, <clears throat> I have given to them, <clears throat> that they may be even one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Okay? All right. So, so here Jesus even, he even brings this picture, this analogy, up to the highest, the highest degree. He says it's, uh, it's in some, some sense like the relationship that, the, that he has with the Father. All right? Our relationship with him, our communion with him. So what do we know about that relationship between the, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Well, well, we know there's, what, there's perfect unity, there's perfect harmony, perfect love, and joy, and fellowship uh, that exists right, within the Godhead, all right? Um, and so, so we can draw something from that about what, well, what our relationship with Christ is like. Okay? Jesus compares it to that, all right? Okay, so we have these uh, different analogies to kind of help us and they're drawn from different relationships, you know, drawn from, uh, you know, inanimate objects, stones, and the chief cornerstone, all the way up to this, to the, the, the relationship that exists between the members of the Godhead. Um, and so, so that should help us to see something of the, uh, the depth of, of the relationship that we have with Christ, of, our, of the, our, what our union with him uh, involves. Now, I do want to just give a, a caution here because, you know, as helpful as uh, analogies can be, you know, we need to remember an important um, principle that an analogy does not mean there's an, an identical relationship, right? So analogy is, is trying to, to give us a comparison to help us to see some truths about one relationship that we can apply to another relationship. But it doesn't mean that they're equal, Okay, so for example, when, when Jesus talks about our union with him and he makes this bold statement, he compares it with, in some way, to the relationship that he has with his father, that doesn't mean that somehow, you know, we are, um, you know, incorporated into uh, the Godhead in some way, okay? Because that's an error that's been made by heretics throughout church history. For example, today, you may know this, but... Uh, Mormons believe that, that God was once a man like us and that men can become like God. Okay, that's, this is, this is, I don't, maybe you all knew that, but if you don't, that's, this is what they believe. Uh, one of their presidents made this statement, Lorenzo Snow, he became their fifth church president, and they call their presidents, they're also called prophets, uh, in 1898, but he made this statement way back in 1840, right, in the very early beginning stages of uh, the Mormon church. He said this, as man now is, God once was. As God is now, man may be. Okay? And uh, this was, uh, you know, this has never been retracted by the Mormon church. In fact, Brigham Young, who was the second president of the, of the Mormon church, he made this statement. He, he delivered a message in 1852 at the Salt Lake Tabernacle, and he affirmed this teaching. He said, this is what he said, the Lord created you and me for the purpose of becoming gods like himself. Okay? So I don't know enough about, you know, uh, Mormon theology to know exactly where this, uh, you know, heretical teaching came from, except that obviously it came from, it came from the pit of hell, right? It's, it's satanic. But it's possible that it arose from a wrong understanding of these verses that we've looked at in John, where Jesus makes this comparison about our union with him to his union with God the Father. Okay? And so... Um, so we want to be careful when we look at analogies. We don't, we don't stretch them too far. We don't try to make an, you know, an identical relationship. Now, just as an aside, um, you know, if you've ever, ever had any dealings with Mormons, they're very orthodox when you speak with them. Uh, we went to Utah last summer, 
Uh, we were in Salt Lake City, um, which is a beautiful city, and we, so we had some time, and so we actually we toured the, the Mormon Square there. And um, we engaged uh, several people, and we could talk with several people on the grounds, uh, uh, shared the gospel, and you know, some, they weren't some of the uh, younger, they, they have a lot of these young missionaries that are mostly female, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, kind of roaming the grounds, and so you can kind of engage them somewhat. Um, but one of the older men that was a, kind of a tour guide there, one of our kids, I think it was Amelia, I can't remember, asked him, uh, kind of out of the blue, he said, she said, well, do you believe in the Trinity? And I thought, well, that's a good question. And, uh, and this, this, this gentleman, he, he kind of bent over, like, you know, very, uh, kind of a grandfatherly, you know, he looked down, he said, he said, uh, sweetheart, of course we believe in the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, but the real question is, you know, what do you believe about the Trinity, right? All right, and do your beliefs about the Trinity conform to what the Bible teaches about the Trinity and about other, you know, key doctrinal truths, okay? So, well, and then later we got, uh, we got kicked off the grounds for, I guess we got too, uh, too aggressive in, in distributing tracts and we had to deal with the security guards, and, but nonetheless. Um, but, but, now, but I was also thinking about the fact that, you know, that Mormons have this great zeal and it's a, it's a false, it's a blasphemous gospel. I mean, it really is from, you know, it's from, it's from the pit of hell. But yet they have a great deal of zeal, right? And I was thinking about what Brother Tafik was speaking last week about how we, who have the truth, who have the true gospel, we should be motivated to exceed that zeal, right? Amen. All right. Okay, so, so those are some pictures of what this, our relationship with Christ is, is like. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the, the nature and the reality of this union that we have with Christ. And so I gave you this definition earlier from the, uh, the, the Westminster Larger Catechism that said that, that believers are spiritually and mystically, yet really and inseparably joined to Christ. Okay, so let me try to flesh that out a little bit. So what do we mean by spiritually? We're spiritually joined to Christ. Well, whenever that word, we, when we talk about spiritual in the New Testament, that's, that's always a reference to uh, the Holy Spirit, okay? And so, so by spiritual, we mean that this, the bond of this union that we have in Christ, it's found in the Holy Spirit himself, okay? He is the one who, who uh, binds us to Christ, all right? Now, where do we see that? Well, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Okay? So it's the Spirit of God that baptizes us into the body of Christ. He is the one who, who uh, affects this uh, union that we have in Christ. Okay? Um, now, our union with Christ, Christ is also spiritual in the sense that, that it is a spiritual relationship that we have with him. Um, and it's, it's a little hard to, uh, to define this precisely. And let me give you a comment here by uh, some uh, you know, wiser men than me, wiser theologians. Okay, this is what uh, uh, John Murray says about this. He says, this union is of an intensely spiritual character consistent with the nature and work of the Holy Spirit, so that in a real way, surpassing our power of analysis, Christ dwells in his people and his people dwell in him. Okay? And so uh, that was helpful to me, that this is a real union we have, it's a spiritual union, but you know, if you try to uh, you know, fully comprehend or explain that, I don't, you know, I don't think we have, I don't have the capacity to, to fully do that, all right? But yet it's a real, true union that we have with Christ. Now, uh, another theologian that has been helpful to me is uh, Robert Raymond. And so he uses an analogy here that's, that was helpful also. This is what he says. He says that though our union, union with Christ is spiritual and mystical, this non-material union with Christ is as real as though there were in fact a literal umbilical cord uniting them reaching all the way from Christ in heaven to the believer on earth, okay? Okay, and so that was helpful to me, to think about the idea of, you know, what does an umbilical cord do? Well, it connects the baby 
to his mother, from which the baby receives what? All of his nourishment, right? Comes from the mother through the umbilical cord, right? Now, the baby may not always... I'm not a neonatal uh, specialist, but, but I don't think the baby may not, be, may not even be conscious of, of the fact that that's where the nourishment is coming from, right? I mean, babies are conscious. I know that. They, they, they're you know, pain, and they can, but they may not know, you know, make the connection between the umbilical cord and the mother, and that's where the nourishment comes from, right? But nonetheless, it's there. And so, so I think that's the idea here is that we have this relationship that we are connected to Christ, you know, whether we're fully uh, consciously aware of it all the time or not. Uh, and that, that is how we receive the nourishment and the strength and the help that we need, not only to begin the Christian life, but to continue to press on and to, and to go on, all right? All right. Um, so, all right, so our very existence as a Christian, as well as our growth and grace, and our future hope of glory, last time we talked about glorification, right, you know, the future state that we have to look forward to, right? All of that is wrapped up, is grounded in the fact that we have a spiritual union with Christ, okay? From whom we obtain all the strength and power we need to live the Christian life. And Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He says... Um, He's he's speaking about Christ, and he says, But he, Christ, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay? So the strength, the the help, the power that we need to live the Christian life, it's, it's found it's found in Christ, all right? And we access that power by virtue of the fact that we are in union, in a spiritual communion, a real union with Him, okay? And so to, to deny or to be ignorant of this truth, the fact that we have this union with Christ, um, it's not only to deny just a kind of a fundamental, uh, you know, uh, truth, a doctrine, this is an, this is a uh, a truth, a cardinal truth that we need to be aware of, but it's also, if we deny this or if we just ignore it, it's going to lead to what? Well, it's going to lead to probably stagnation and, and, and a, a stunting of your growth and grace, all right? Um, on the other hand, if, if we're conscious of this union that we have with Christ, uh, that it's a, it's a permanent union that can't be broken, uh, that should... Uh, and if we get serious about realizing that if Christ has died, we have died with him. We've died to sin. If Christ has been raised, we have been raised with him, in, in a sense now, in the sense that we have the power to overcome sin, right? And so um, th- this will help us to, in, our, in, our, in our sanctification, right? And that verse we read earlier in Romans 6, verse 11 says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God, how? In Christ Jesus. All right, so that's the significance of understanding this idea that we have, a, we have an actual union with Christ, and this should, it should be a, a practical help to help us in our daily, our daily walk. All right? All right, well, let me close with some uh, other conclusions and maybe another application or two. So this idea of uh, being united with Christ it's the fountain from which flows every other spiritual blessing, all right? So these different aspects of salvation that we've been looking at in the past, we've looked at uh, repentance and faith and uh, justification, adoption, sanctification, perseverance, all these uh, aspects of our salvation, all these flow from the fact that we are united to Christ, okay? That we are in this uh, intimate relationship with Christ. Uh, that verse we read earlier, I'm going to read this again, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, where? In Christ, how? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Um, also, it's good to remember to think about the fact that we were chosen when? We were chosen before the creation of the world, and what was our position? How are we? We were chosen in Christ. All right? And so in God's eye and God's perspective, we were in Christ. We were united to Christ his death, his resurrection. Um, we, don't, we don't actually partake of the benefits of that union until what? Well, we have to actually believe. We have to trust in Christ. We have to believe in him, right? Um, and then all those benefits of being united to him 
they flow to us. All right, so, so the degree to which you and I take seriously the reality of our spiritual union with Christ, well, to that degree, we will be growing in progressive sanctification and holiness. Okay, so this is not a, you know, an esoteric uh, kind of a, you know, nice, you know, thing to dust off in the theology textbook. This is something that should practically help us to, to grow, okay, and to mature and become more and more holy and more and more like Christ. Now, another application I thought of this truth is that, you know, this should give a great deal of assurance. If you s- struggle with assurance, struggle, you know, whether or not you're saved and you just, you have a lot of doubts, well, I think meditating on this truth of the fact that we, if you're a Christian, we have an eternal union with Christ, okay? And think about all the blessings that flow by virtue of that union with Christ. Uh, well, that should, should help you to uh, understand that that union, uh, it's, it can never be broken. Now, you know, that the analogy we looked at earlier of Jesus says that our union with him is like the relationship he has with the Father, okay, and with the Spirit, right? Well, well, what is that? Again, that, well, that, what kind of relationship is that? Well, it's, it's a perfect relationship, right? It's, it's harmonious. It's absolutely secure, right? I mean, if there could ever be any uh, discord or severing of the relationships within the Godhead, well, I mean, God would, would cease to exist, all right? But that's not possible, all right? We're, we're told many places throughout the Bible, Psalms 90, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, okay? And so, so if you've trusted in Christ by faith and there's evidence in your life, there's some credible evidence that, that you have been changed and that there's an ongoing uh, repentance from sin and a, and a desire for greater and greater holiness of life, well, then you should have great assurance that you have been united to Christ, okay? And that union cannot and will not ever be broken, okay? So that should, that should help with, uh, with assurance. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you've never confessed your sins to God, you've never repented of your sins, what does it mean to repent? What does it mean to repent? To turn, yeah, to turn, right? I was, I was looking at the children. It means to turn, to turn from your sin, right? Uh, if you've never done that, if you've never believed on Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation, then none of these blessings that we've been talking about apply to you, okay? And so if you're not in Christ by virtue of believing on him and trusting him alone for salvation, then the, then the Bible says there's only one other alternative, right? You are what? You are, you are outside of Christ, okay? And if you're outside of Christ and you remain there, then you have no protection against, against God's righteous and his holy wrath against sin. Okay, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, and 9, we're warned. What are we warned there? Jesus is going to return. He's coming back, right? We don't know when that is. And when he comes back, what's he going to, how is he coming? Well, he's coming in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Okay, and that's a fearful prospect, all right? So I would uh, just plead with you, if you don't know Christ, if you haven't believed on him, if you haven't turned to him, do it today. Flee to him now while the door of salvation is still open. Um, And I pray that God would give you grace to acknowledge your sins, to repent, to turn from them, and to believe on Christ. And if you do, you will be united to Jesus Christ. You'll have a union with him that we've been talking about, and you'll receive all of these wonderful blessings of being in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that forever. Well, amen. May God God help us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we come to you this morning, and we just uh, we just praise you, Lord. We praise you for <clears throat> who you are. We praise you for the great salvation that you have provided for us, for your people. Lord, we thank you that, that in some way that we can't fully uh, understand or comprehend, you chose, you chose your people in Christ before the foundation of the world. Lord, we thank you that, that we those of us who have come to faith and believed on your Son enjoy all these rich blessings of being in union with the Son and being in union with you through the Son. 
We thank you for the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit who comes and seals us and, and applies these benefits and, 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 and bonds us to Christ. Father, we just thank you for these, these great truths, and we pray that you'd help us to understand them more deeply, help us to appreciate them. Father, help these truths to, to, to spur us on to, to greater uh, holiness and a, and a greater love and, and affection uh, and a gratitude to you. So we, we just pray that you would, uh, uh, you would cause these truths to sink deep into our hearts, that they would have a practical effect on our lives. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.